Chapter 5 Red Wolf was jolted into consciousness by a loud clanging. With a thumping heart, he clapped his hands over his ears and ran for his mother. He fell from the bed and landed flat on his face on the wooden floorboards. The wolf head pendant falling from his hand and skittering across the floor, disappearing under the next bed. Everyone was looking at him and laughing at him. He knew this even though he lay face down on the floor, but all he was worried about was if anyone had seen the wolf head. He pleaded with it to remain hidden until he could safely retrieve it. Silence, Father Thomas ordered. The laughter stopped. Red Wolf scrambled to his feet, the foreign surroundings crashing into him like a charging bull moose. Instantly he was wide awake and terrified. Outside the barred window it was still dark, but in the yellow lamplight he could see the other boys in their nightshirts, kneeling beside their beds, pressing their palms and fingers together. Red Wolf knelt beside his bed and copied them, but he peeked through narrowed eyes, not wanting to miss any command that might earn him punishment. Father Thomas was wearing a white night robe, was talking in a language that made no sense. He rocked back and forth on his slippered heels, exposing glimpses of blue-gray ankles. He didn't have his ruler with him. Red Wolf followed the priest's upward gaze, wondering who he was talking to up there. But he could see no one. The wooden beams and rafters were more substantial than the slim poles of his birch bark wigwam. But there was no opening for the smoke from the fire. In fact, there was no fire. Red Wolf had never lived without fire, and the damp cold of the dorm soon caused him to shiver. Amen, the boys said. Mr. Hall, his bald head shining the lamp light, entered the dormitory making a drumming rhythm by smacking his walking cane into the palm of his hand. Red Wolf thought that soon there would be singing or dancing. He was shocked when the boys who had wet beds leaned over to touch their toes, upending their bare bottoms. Mother Hall used words to admonish each child. Then Mr. Hall used his cane, and finally Father Thomas added a blessing. It went like this. You filthy boy! Whack! God save your heathen soul! Amen! You disgusting bedwetter! Whack! God save you from your pagan ways! Amen. You good-for-nothing Indian, whack. God bless you, even though you're an Indian. In this manner, Red Wolf began to understand the English language. Still in their nightshirts, the boys put on their school boots. Red Wolf fumbled at the trailing laces and then hid them down inside the boots again against his bare ankles. Ablutions, Mother Hall shouted. Sh choosing a boy to carry the communal night soil bucket. Immediately, the children fell into line behind the boy with the pail. Red Wolf brought up the rear where he imitated the rhythm of their swinging arms and marching feet. The line proceeded out the dormitory, along the corridor, down two flights of stairs, and along a passageway to the side of the building. As soon as the first boy in line pushed open the door, Red Wolf wriggled his nose at the stench and then stood aghast at the sight that met his eyes. Some twenty boys sat on a long bench that straddled a deep, smelly trench. Their nightshirts were hiked up around their waists, and ankle boots on the ends of bare legs waved in the air. A boy jumped off the bench, and the next in line took his place, then another, and another. When it was Red Wolf's turn, he didn't move fast enough. Hurry up! Get on the throne! The latrine orderly said. You have two minutes. After that, you have to wait until tomorrow. Red Wolf didn't understand the words, though he knew what he was supposed to do. But since the orderly's demeanor was not threatening, since his skin was brown and not white, since he held no ruler or leather strips, Red Wolf didn't rush. You lost ten seconds already the youth said, stretching his hand towards Red Wolf and showing him the pocket watch in his palm. Had Red Wolf's senses not already been in overload, the moving hands of the timepiece would have fascinated him. Instead, he approached the vacant space on the bench, holding his breath, peered through the round hole in the wood. In the wood. It looked very big, and he wondered if he could balance on it without falling through. But the orderly was getting increasingly impatient, so he climbed up, trying not to sit on his nightshirt, and settled his skinny buttocks over the hole. For the next part of the ablutions routine, Red Wolf went to the adjacent wash house and waited in line again. When it was his turn, he hung a bucket 
over the spigot and then leaned his body weight over the long handle. He was impressed when icy water instantly spewed into the pail without any sign of a lake or a river. He carried the half-filled bucket to where other boys were stripping off their nice shirts and washing their bodies under the vigilant eyes of Mother Hall. Once again, he watched carefully and copied the others, first picking up a cake of lye, soap, and a rag, then washing himself in the following order, hands, face, armpits, backside, feet. Finally, a larger rag was used to rub dry. Throughout this part of the daily routine, Mother Hall repeated a mantra that Red Wolf would later come to understand. Cleanliness is next to godliness. After pouring the dirty water down a drain and hanging the rags to dry, the children donned their nightshirts and boots again and marched back to the dormitory to make their beds and put on their school uniforms. While everyone was distracted, Red Wolf scrambled under the bed as though his life depended on it, retrieved the wolf head, and plunged it safely in his pocket. For a few moments he felt much better, but as soon as Mother Hall noticed his untied laces, his stomach tensed again. You've got to learn this quickly, she said, bending over and tying a bow. I can't be leaning over all the time, not with this bad back of mine. Redwell strained to see how the woman manipulated the laces, but Mother Hall's spindly fingers moved too fast, and then it was breakfast. Never had Red Wolf seen a room as large as the refectory, that never had seen so and never had seen so many boys. They were all wearing the same clothes and same vacant expressions and they all were silent. A plump woman at the counter ladled food into the upheld bowls. He stared at the thick, lumpy goop, but was soon pushed along by impatient boys steered towards one of the many plank tables. A booming voice broke the silence. Let us pray. Red Wolf copied the other children as they bowed their heads, closed their eyes, and held their hands in positions he had learned earlier that morning. Thank you, Lord. For the bounty that you have provided for us today, for the food which we will now enjoy. Red Wolf peeked at Father Thomas. The priest has changed out of his night clothes and was once again wearing the black robe from the previous day. The boy thought it strange that the robe had no openings at the front. The robes of the people opened down the front. Mr. Hall's shirt opened down the front. So did Red Wolf's new school shirt and the shirts of the other boys. But Father Thomas's robe didn't seem to have any openings, and the stiff white collar that throttled his neck appeared to be the wrong way around, too. Red Wolf wondered if the priest had forgotten the right way to dress himself. The boy looked at the cross sticks that hung from Father's neck. Red Wolf furtively slipped his hand into his trouser pocket and caressed the piece of carved bone, seeing the image of the wolf through his fingertips. The warmth that came to his fingers as he rubbed them over the bone made him feel warm all over. My wolf is much nicer than his sticks. Is that why they tried to take it away from me? Do they want it for themselves? Finally, the boy de deduced correctly that since the priest was the only one wearing women's skirts, the only one wearing his clothing backwards, and the only one wearing the cross sticks, Father Thomas must be the chief. Red Wolf's stomach growled. He had not eaten since the previous morning, and he was hungry. Food was in front of everyone, but nobody was eating. They were poised over their bowls, immobile as rock carvings, heads lowered, eyes closed, palms together. Red Wolf ascertained that Father Thomas's eyes were firmly shut, and then quickly dunked two fingers into the porridge and scooped it into his mouth. He had barely tasted the sticky food when a firm blow onto the back of his head sent his hands flying into this bowl. There will be no eating when Father Thomas is talking to our Lord, hissed Mr. Hall, his bald head with outrage and orange hairs bristling from his ears. Mr. Hall's angry outburst was over as quickly as it had come, and Father Thomas continued his prayer. Thank you, Lord, for all the gifts you have bestowed on us today. Thank you for providing these lost children with this home, and thank you for giving me and all the staff here another day to minister to their souls. And for what we are about to receive, make us truly grateful. The chorus of Amen was barely out of the mouths of the children before they were shoveling down spoonfuls of porridge. Red Wolf stared around him in disbelief, absently licking the sticky mess from his fingers. It was now Mother Hall who whacked him on the back of his head. Spoon, she said, pushing a shiny cold utensil into his hand. Only savages eat with their hands. Red Wolf 
took the spoon and copied the others, but he had lost his appetite, and he did not like the taste of the food. He listened to the clanging, clanging of, and scraping of metal spoons on enameled bowls. The sound was abrasive and jarring compared to the duller sounds of maple ladles on maple bowls. He laid his spoon and waited. Nishin, eat, quick! The boy next to him whispered in the language of the people, If you don't, they hold you, and they push, you d they push it down your throat, and you get a haircut like Henry over there. He gestured his lower lip to a boy who had three-finger-wide strip of baldness running down the center of his scalp from his forehead to his nape. In horror, Red Wolf ate the food, almost gagging on the lumps. He had barely finished when the bell clanged, and without a word, the boys were instantly on their feet waiting in silence in several lines to wash, dry, and stack their own dishes and spoons. With the dishwashing done, and with the bell clanging yet again, the boys walked silently away in different directions. Red Wolf didn't know where to go. Follow Henry, the other boy whispered. He's in grade one. He should be in grade two like me, but he's doing grade one again. Why? Red Wolf asked. Because, because he's a stupid Indian.